Okay, folks. Okay, a couple of very quick uh, administrative details. First, has anybody tried getting on Capital IQ since I sent that email? Or you, have you been able to get on? Okay. Who's not, who's been able to get on? Who's not been able to get on? What the hell is going on here, right? I mean, how can it be so random? So first, when you say you can get on, you can get on on your laptop at home? There's an issue with the link. So you have to go to the Capital IQ homepage and then log in using Capital Okay. Click on the link and Oh, I see, okay. So I'll try to, I'll send you the homepage for Capital IQ. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe they're, some pathways are shut off. I have no idea what IT does. So uh, I would send you to them, but you know what happens when you go ask IT questions. You come back with the same outcome you had before you went in. So let me be the, the go-between on that. But it looks like it's a randomized problem. It's not everybody, it's some people. So it must be the entry point that you use. And I really want you to be able to use capital like you, not so much for this class. But really, this is something, we talk about big data as if it's this fuzzy thing. We're in the middle of big data. And the reason I'm a little skeptical about big data is I actually am in a business, in finance, where big data has been the name of the game for 50 years. And fat lot of good that has done active money managers, right? So next time somebody says, we're going to use big data to make money, okay. it's not that easy. I want to start off with... Um, an anecdote, Lana, Lana who you know, is sitting in the second row here, told me at the end of the class, there, there she is. And, um, so she's obviously from Russia. Uh, if you, so she, um, not obviously, but she is from <laughs> Russia. <laughs> and it, she said in 2008, she went into a Russian bank and deposited her money, and the Russian bank guaranteed an 8% return in US dollar terms. Here's the good part of the story. She actually collected her 8% return over the next five years, and she's out of the bank. So first question, is that a risk-free rate? I mean, can, let's suppose that you were listening to Lana in 2008 in Russia, and he said, you know what? It's a guaranteed rate. That's what a risk-free rate is. I'm going to use 8% as my risk-free rate in US dollars. Is it a, is it a risk-free rate? How good is a guarantee? only as good as the guarantor, right? So let me ask you a practical question. How does a Russian bank guarantee an 8% dollar return? What do you think they did in 2008 to pull off this game? It's a very simple game. Go back to the carry trade, and you're going to see the basis for this game. They collected Lana's money, promised her 8%. 
then invested it where? In Russian rubles making 12%. And then they get, got down on their knees and hoped and prayed that what wouldn't happen? That the ruble would not depreciate. And guess what? Between 2008 and 2013, it didn't. Now, of course, Lana got advance notice of the Ukraine invasion. I'm just kidding, she didn't. <laughs> but, but she got out when the going was good. And I think her story ended with 60 Russian banks declaring bankruptcy in the last year. And you can see. Se se 70 banks went bankrupt. And you can see why, right? Because if you promise an 8% guaranteed return, you invest 12% in, in Russian rubles, and the exchange rate collapses, you are completely and totally done. And of course, for those five years, you'd have said, hey, that's a great way to make money. You know, take money in, promise 8%, make 12%. It lasts only so long before the wheels come off the car. You know when the Swiss, the Swiss uh, you know, revalued their, the Swiss franc early last year? Where they basically, this was something that people thought that would never happen. Polish homeowners started defaulting at record rates in the months after. Why? They were, the Polish homeowners were borrowing in Swiss francs to buy their houses in Poland. Why? Because the Swiss franc rate was lower. This is exactly the game we're talking about, where people play games in different currencies, hope it doesn't catch up with them, and a lot of time they get away with it, right? At some point in time, those things kind of blow up on you, and that's when you see everything wiped out. So let's go back to where I left you on Monday. I was talking about implied equity risk premiums, and I showed you what the premium was in November of 2013, and I also told you it changes all the time. We're now in February 2016. Obviously, the November 2013 premium of 5.5% is no longer the premium you'd use for the US. And I also mentioned at the start of every month, I compute the implied premium for the US. I'll show you what the implied premium looked like at the start of January 2016. And I'll update you through what it was at the start of February. And in about four days, you will find the next update showing up on your Twitter feed. I'm sure you've all listened. and put your names in. And so on the first, I will send out the updated premium. So this is January 1st of 2016. The S&P 500 was at 2044. So you're buying the, the 500 largest companies. The cash flows coming into 2016 on the S&P 500 was 106. Take a look at the composition. 60% is coming from buybacks, 40% from dividends. The expected growth rate in earnings for the S&P 500 at the start of this year was 5.55%. So remember what we did. We took what you paid, 2043. We, expe we got the expected cash flows in the next five years. Beyond the fifth year, I set the growth rate equal to the risk-free rate, and I solved for the discount rate. The Excel spreadsheet, that's all it is, the gold, gold seek or the solver function. I came up with an expected return of 8.39%. At the start of 2016, if you invested in US stocks, and these were the cash flows you were expecting, you could expect to make an 8.39% rate of return. You subtract out the risk-free rate, the implied equity risk premium at the start of 2016 was 6.12%. Now, I could ask you to go look it up, look up the February 2016 update, but you can probably guess at least direction. What happened between January 1st and February 1st in terms of stocks? What happened to stock prices? They dropped about 8%. Let's not use the word plummeted. It's kind of scary. They dropped about 8%. Okay? Words matter. Actually, in behavioral finance, they, they discovered that the way you describe something can actually trigger more. So if you're a journalist and you want to really create a market calamity, you want to use a word like plummet. They dropped about 8%. Think of the math, right? Think bond prices and interest rates, because the answer is going to come through if you think about bond prices and interest rates. If stock prices drop 8% and nothing else changes that much, what's going to happen to your expected return on stocks? Is it going to go up or down? It's going to go up. Think of, think of why. When bond prices go down, what happens to the yield to maturity? It goes up. Lower price, higher yield to maturity, because you got the, you're paying less for the same cash flows. 
So the expected return on stocks went up by about 0.2%. But that's not all. The risk-free rate, when I did this, was 2.27%. You know what it was at the start of February? It was down to 1.8%. So the risk-free rate has dropped. Equity price have dropped. So the expected return on stocks have, has gone up. The implied equity risk premium at the start of 2000, uh, February 2016 was about 6.5%. That's in one month the numbers have changed. You're saying, oh my god, this will mean that my cost of capital is going to be a shifting number. Yes, get used to it. And in fact, one interesting thing, and th to me this is the one number that I keep track of every month because it first gives me some perspective. When things go crazy, I can step back and say, where does this number fall in the larger scheme of things? So I'm going to show you a graph of the implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500 going back to 1960. So think of what I did at the start of 2016. Think of doing that all the way through 1960. This tells you the history of US stocks for the last 65 years, and perhaps tells us what's coming. 1960 through 70, the, the implied equity risk premium in the US was between 3 and 3.5%. Three and Incredibly stable period for US stocks. The US was the global economy. What happened, and this was the time when as GM goes, so goes the economy. As, as the US economy goes, so goes the global economy, 1960s. Then you get to the 1970s. Notice something's happening. The implied equity risk premium is shooting up. Now let me pause right there. Is this good news or bad news if you're a stockholder? Equity risk premiums are going up. What's happening to stock prices? They're going down. In fact, 1978, the implied equity risk premium in the US hit 6.5%. You know what the Dow was at that year? 750. Three digits on the Dow, 750. It's what, 16,000, 17,000 right now? In fact, in 1978, the headline on Business Week ran, the death of stocks. And here's a great contrarian indicator. When the business magazines tell you this is the end, you should be taking everything you have, borrowing everything you can, and putting it all into stocks. Because starting in 1978, you got one of the great bull markets of all time. From 1978 through 99, look at what's happening in the implied premium there. Blips here and there, but you start at six and a half, and it drifts down and down and down. In fact, at the end of 99, the implied equity risk premium in the US was 2%. You know why that number should scare you? Remember that survey I did in class on Monday where I asked you, what's your equity risk premium? And asked how many of you would settle for 3 to 5%, which is a premium of 0 to 2? Not a single hand went up in this entire room. And I got to, four to uh, five, 5 to 7, 7 to 9, people start putting up their hands. So if you stay true to what you told me on Monday, that none of you would accept an equity risk premium of 2% because it's too low. That's effectively what he was saying. What are you telling me about stock prices at the end of 99? If equity risk premiums are too low, stock prices are too high. So everybody must have been out of stocks at the end of 99, right? The end of 99 was the dot-com boom. Everybody was into stocks, and that is my definition of a bubble. Because here's what the bubble is. If at the end of 99, I'd come to you as a stock investor and say, what do you think you'll make on stocks? You know what your answer would have been? I think I can make 15, 20, 25. Why? Because for the last decade, that's what everybody else was making. So you were expecting to make these big equity risk premiums, but you were pricing stocks to earn a 2% premium. Something's got to give. And that something is not going to be reality, it's got to be our expectations. What does that mean? You're going to say, wake up and say, oh my God, I'm settling for a 2% premium. I thought I needed to make 10%, and the way you adjust is you sell stocks like crazy. There's the dot-com bust, right? The premium bounces back to about 4%. It stays around 4% for about five years, lulling me into a false sense of complacency. In what sense? In early 2008, if you ask me, what's the equity risk premium for a mature market? I'd have said it's about 4%. And then I'd have said something that would have gotten me into trouble a few months later. I'd have said, and it's probably not going to change very much. It's a pretty stable number. And of course, last, last session, I showed you what happened just in those four months. Now, here's what's happened since 2008. Not only are equity risk premiums elevated to what they, what they used to be pre-2008, they've become much more volatile. 
A 40 basis point move like you saw in the last month would never have happened in 2005, 95, 85, or 75. We are, I mean, if the people, if, if the question you're asking is, are equities riskier today than they were 10 years ago? The answer is absolutely yes. And you can use whatever indicator you want, VIX or whatever else to counter it, but the reality is look at how people are pricing stocks. They're pricing it to earn a higher risk premium. Why might that be? Why are stocks risky? I think we've started digging, the, you know, coming to that answer even last session. It's globalization. The essence of globalization is everybody's problem is everybody else's problem. In the 1960s, if you were the US and China went into a crisis, you know what your response would have been? Where's China? You essentially were insulated as a domestic economy, and this was true for lots of domestic economies. You could talk about how the economy was doing, and you could very quickly jump to the conclusion of, this is what stocks should be doing. If the economy is doing well, stocks should be doing well. That connection is now dead. And that's something we have to remember. So when people talk about this, and you see people on CNBC say, I think the US economy is going to be strong, so let's take that for whatever it's given. Let's assume they actually know what they're talking about. So let's, let's concede that to them. And then they will say, because the US economy is strong, stocks should go up. That's no longer true. The US economy could be strong, but if Latin America goes into a crisis, stocks could still go down. It's a flip side of globalization. Which means I think this is the game you're going to be playing for the rest of your working lives. And perhaps into your retired lives, because your portfolio is going to have this, which is we're in a period now where equity risk premiums are not just going to be higher, but they're going to stay elevated. They're going to be much more volatile going forward because of the, the way we've constructed the global economy. Any questions? Now also, you might have, especially in the last two or three years, there's been a lot of talk of bubbles, some from people who have Nobel Prizes, who I will leave unnamed. For, I mean, let, let me name the names, you know, why, why leave them unnamed. There's a Schiller P. Robert Schiller, two years ago, won the Nobel Prize. Every chance he gets, he tells us there's a bubble. And of course, he made his reputation because he called the 2008 bubble, which he called in 1998. I call these the ER chorus. Have you ever watched the Winnie the Pooh movies? Or read the Winnie the Pooh books? Have you ever heard of ER? Think ER, and you have a perpetual bubbler. Why does a bubble? If you listen to these guys, you'd be stuck in money market funds for the rest of your life. But here's a very simple response. Somebody says, hey, I know markets are in a bubble. How the hell do you know? And you point to a P, P is higher than it used to be. Remember what I gave you is my essence of a bubble. The bubble is when you price stocks to earn a really low premium, and you're telling me you will make a really high premium. By that standard, what's the premium as of February? 6.5%, right? Look at 6.5% on the graph. Where is it, at a low point or a high point? To me, it looks like we're almost at the peak of historical premium. So you're pricing stocks to earn 6.5%. That, to me, is not what I'd expect to see in a bubble. What I saw in 99 was a bubble. You were pricing. So when you hear talk about a bubble, step back and think about the implied premium. It might give you some perspective on whether you should be taking the stock seriously. I'm not saying stocks can't drop 30%, but if they drop 30%, it's going to be because there's some global crisis that affects cash flows and growth, not because they were overpriced relative to last year's earnings and cash flows. That's a different issue. So now let me show you my updated. So last session I showed you the November 2013 risk premiums by country. This is the January 2016 risk premiums by country. And if you go to my website, you'll see the February 2016 update of this number. So let me start easy again. At the start of 2016, I took the 6.12% I got for the US, and I rounded it down to 6%. You're saying, that's so imprecise. I don't want to give you the delusion that somehow I know the equity risk premium to the second decimal point. I think it's about 6%, so I'm going to make 6% my base premium for every country with a AAA rating. So you'll see 6% pop up all over. For every other country, what do I do? Somebody remind me how I get the equity risk premium. Everybody's looking down there. Do you want to remind me how do I get the equity risk premium? Mm -hmm. Oh, you start with the country risk default spread. 
So by now you notice the pattern. Even if you don't know the answer, I'll fill it in, right? So you start with the default spread that you get either by looking at the rating or the CDS market. Then you scale up that spread and you add it on to the 6%. So I get equity risk premiums for much of the world. Until last year, there were about 20 countries for which I could not get an equity risk premium. Why? They had no sovereign CDS spreads, they had no dollar denominated bonds, and they had no sovereign ratings. Moody's and S&P didn't even bother. These are called frontier markets. And my response if anybody emailed me from a frontier market was, what kind of equity risk premium should I use? A really high one, and then end the conversation. I'll give you an, an example, and, and I wish I had made this up because as I read this email, it seemed almost made up. It was from a Syrian business person. There's actually one guy left in Syria who's actually running a business still. And remember, you're a Syrian business person. You still have to make investment decisions. And he wanted to come up with a hurdle rate. And I said, maybe you're hurdle as you jump over Assad. Yeah. But that didn't help. So I had to come up with a number for Sirius. So if you look at the very top over there to the right-hand corner, it's also in your notes. These are my frontier markets. These are about 20 countries for which there isn't a rating for which I tried to come up with an equity risk premium. So let me give you an example. Let's take Libya. There's no rating. No. Is it a risky country? You bet. I had to come up with a measure of country risk for Libya. And what I fell back on was a score called the Political Risk Service. It's a, it's a service in Europe called PRS. It gives country risk scores to countries, looking at all kinds of different com you know, components of risk. They come up with a numerical score. So Libya, for instance, has a 52.8 score. You're saying, what does it even mean? The scores run from 0 to 100. The higher the number, I'm sorry, the lower the number, the riskier the country. The riskiest country in the world, according to PRS, at the start of 2016, was Syria, 35.8. But let's take Libya, 52.3. They have no rating. They have no CDS. They have no dollar-denominated bonds. I want to come up with the country risk premium for Libya. Guess what I did? I took that PRS score of 52.8. I went looking for other countries with similar scores. And PRS rates 165 countries. Let's say I find four other countries with PRS scores very similar to Libya, and I did. And three of those countries have ratings. I used the equity risk premium of the three countries that were closest to Syria to come up with an equity risk premium for, uh, I'm sorry, for Libya, to come up with an equity risk premium for Libya. You're saying that's reaching? I agree. It's desperation time. But at least it lets me fill in those last few blanks here. So, and you say, when would I ever have a company that's exposed in Libya? You value Halliburton or Baker Hughes. I mean, these are big defense contracts. Guess what? You better get used to dealing with frontier markets because that's where they do their business. So this is, again, something about valuing a Syrian company or a Libyan company. It's about using these numbers to value the companies you and I might face on a daily basis. Any questions about country risk? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put up a webcast this week on estimating company risk because this is something you're going to face as you look at your companies. Because I said to come up with the equity risk premium for a company, what do you need? You need a breakdown of where they do business. You think companies would do a good job of it, right? They tell you how. At least regionally, you'd expect North America, South America. U.S. companies are among the sloppiest companies in the world when it comes down to breaking out geographical revenues. In fact, Amazon and Netflix, this is how they break their revenues down. North America, which is mostly US as far as they're concerned. They don't even see Canada, I think. But even if they did, Canada has the same equity risk premium as the US. And the rest of the world, come on guys, the rest of the world is a really big place. Can you start being more specific? So you are actually going to run into that problem of companies not breaking it down. And what you have to do then is take the rest of the world and make your best assessment what the equity risk premium is for the rest of the world. 
It's actually very easy if you have, because I'm going to give you the spreadsheet with the equity experience, the GDPs for every country. Here's all you need to do. Go in and take the GDP of the US and Canada and make it zero. You know what the spreadsheet is going to do. It's going to compute a weighted average for the globe. With the, so it's actually just algebra. Go in and change the GDPs. I wish this were not the case, that companies did a better job of breaking their revenues down, but you have to live with what you have. Okay? This is actually the most downloaded data set on my website, by far. Hey, I've been putting this up, these country risk premiums on my website, probably going back 20 years. It's the most downloaded, and it's used in the strangest places. I'll give you three examples. I get an email from the New Zealand Milk Board. I didn't even know there was a milk board in New Zealand. They say, we're setting milk prices for New Zealand farmers, and we're using your country risk premiums to set those prices. Who are you selling the milk to, Zimbabwe? And usually the question is a pretty straightforward one. How do you come up with these numbers? And I send them, it's not rocket science. I take the rating. I get the, so basically think of last class. And um, you know, I have a YouTube video and, and a little PDF file I send. So this is what I do. So that was easy. On my data set, I can also check to see where people are coming in to visit my data set every year. So, so I just keep track of it to see if I'm attracting strange countries. And usually the, the standard top 10 you can pretty much rank it up. The US is on top, then you have India as the second biggest, and then you have you know, Brazil. So basically, and the rest are all English-speaking countries, and then you kind of get to maybe France, Spain. For the last three years, every year, Lithuania has shown up as one of the top 10 countries from which people have been saying, what the hell are people in Lithuania coming to my site for? It turns out that the Lithuanian natural resource, there's a government board that attracts contracts, or, you know, they're the ones who determine who to give the contracts to, have required people who bid on contracts to use my country risk premiums when they make their judgments. I don't get a commission on this, no, that's, I'm okay with that. But once in a while I get an email that really is over the top. I'll give you my least favorite email of all time. April of 2009, I get an email from Lebanon. I'm pretty excited, I don't get that many emails about valuation in the Middle East, I open the email, and here's how it begins. You have destroyed Lebanon. <laughs> what? <laughs> I can see myself destroying Luxembourg or Liechtenstein or one of these quasi-European municipalities that you can walk through in 15 minutes. But destroy Lebanon after 30 years of civil war in Hezbollah? I'm the guy who did it. <laughs> so I keep reading, what the hell did I do? How did this happen? And the email was actually from a Lebanese business person whose business had been appraised for value by an appraiser, and the appraiser had used the equity risk premium for Lebanon for my website to come up with the hurdle rate and the valuation. Let's take a look at Lebanon. In 2016, the equity risk premium in attaching Lebanon is 14.2%. That's a pretty high number. In April of 2009, that number was 16.5%. It was a huge premium right after the crisis. See why this guy was really pissed off at me? You put in a 16.5% equity risk premium into your hurdle rate, what's going to happen to your cost of equity and cost of capital. It's going to become a really high number. If you get a really high discount rate, what's going to happen to your value? It's going to be a really low number. He felt he'd been gypped, and it was all my fault. My first reaction was, take it up with your appraiser. It's not my problem. Then I did remember the email was from Lebanon. I said, I've got to be a little careful about how I respond. So I look for somebody else to blame. It's actually easy to find somebody. Again, remind me how I come up with these risk premiums. I start, I go to Moody's and I look up your rating, right? So if your rating is in the toilet, because the equity risk premium. So it's not my fault. It's Moody's fault. <laughs> and by the way, if you want their address to put into your GPS, here it is, and I sent them the right address, <laughs> right? So nothing untoward has happened there yet. But what I'm trying to say is there's zero intellectual firepower behind these numbers. I'm not sitting there saying, do I like Brazil or really like the, the, you know, Brazil? Let me give them a lower risk premium. It's completely transparent. You don't like it, at least you can see where it's coming from. Which I think is a lot of, the reason people have trouble with equity risk premiums that people put out is there's always an agenda. I have zero agenda. I couldn't care less what comes out high or low. So it's driven entirely by the default spread, which is its weakness. Why? Because in much of the Middle East, I think I'm underestimating equity risk premiums. Do you see why? Saudi Arabia has very little default risk. Why? Because it doesn't borrow very much money. 
But do you think there's a lot of risk of investing in a business in Saudi Arabia? It's kind of hidden because it's under the surface. So I think across the Middle East, I'm underestimating equity risk premium for the moment. I know I'm doing it, but I can't think of a good way of going from it to a true equity risk premium. So this is a work in process as far as I'm concerned. I've got to come back and think about better ways of doing this. Because in a global economy, this is central to almost everything you do as a company or as an investor. Any questions? So when you get a chance, take your company, and obviously some of you have already started because you are going to run into this issue because people break things down. This morning, actually, I got an email from somebody you know, who was looking at a company where the revenues were broken down into the US, Europe, and emerging markets. God only knows what goes in emerging markets, right? So basically, I, you know, I provide them, do the best you can. And don't go for precision. Don't say, I don't have 3%. Say, ultimately, if you're within shouting distance of your true equity risk premium, you're home free. So don't make this the center of everything you do. But get it done and move on. You can always come back and revisit these numbers. Now let's talk about the third and final input. I need to come up. So basically, we're going towards a hurdle rate. We have a risk-free rate. We have an equity risk premium. We now need a beta. You've taken foundations, you're taking foundations. If you've ever taken a finance class anywhere in your life, you were probably taught betas the same way I was taught betas. In fact, it's interesting. I'm sometimes invited by investment banks to come in and do some re-education programs for bankers, for seasoned bankers who have forgotten the basics. So about 10 years into your banking life, they pull people together, and it's by force. So none of them want to be there. And I have to talk to them. This is not the greatest audience on the face of the earth. They, know, they think they know everything on the face of the earth, when in fact they know nothing. And I've got to remind them of the things that they've sometimes forgotten. So I, rem I know one of the questions I ask them, is because if you're a corporate finance banker, you use betas like they're going out of style. You plug them in, you chug with them, and you use valuations. So I ask the question, where do betas come from? I remember one time I asked this question, and a banker tried to tell me where babies came from. I said, no, I think I get that. Where do betas come from? And they look at me like I have two heads. So what do you mean, where do betas? They come from Bloomberg. <laughs> they come from Barra. Let's face it, you go work for a bank, you're never estimating betas, you're looking them up. They come from a service, becomes the answer, where do betas come from? And if I dig a little deeper, some deep recess memory of theirs comes up. Oh, isn't it some kind of a regression? Yes, it's a very simple regression of returns on the stock against returns on the market index. The slope of that line is the beta. That's the way I was taught betas. That's the way you were taught betas. It's a horrible way to think about betas, but it's the way we're all taught betas. In fact, when you run that regression, in addition to the slope, think of it like in a statistics class. You get two other pieces of output from the regression that we sometimes throw away, but they do tell us something about our company. The first is the intercept. In any typical regression, there's an intercept. I'm going to argue that that intercept that you get from the regression will tell you whether your stock was a good investment or not during the period of the regression. Notice the words I use, was. It's not going to tell you whether it will be, but whether it was. So I'm going to keep my eye on the intercept. You also get an R squared from a regression, right? Anytime you run any regression, the R squared tells you the goodness of fit, which is kind of a meaningless term. It tells you how close the points are to the line and how much of your dependent variable is explained by your independent variable. I'm going to argue that that's going to tell you something about where the risk in your company is coming from. Is it coming from the market or is it coming from the firm? So let me start with the intercept because that to me is the starting point for this process. You run a regression, you show me the intercept. Say, so is this a good number? Was my stock a good investment? I'm going to go back to the original CAPM and ask, what would I expect my stock to have as an intercept if it did exactly what the market, what you expect it to do given the market? So let's take a very simple example. Let's assume you buy a stock with a beta 1.5. Okay. Risk-free rate is 2%. The risk-free rate is 2%, beta is 1.5. In a period where the market does you know, makes 5%, you'd expect your stock to be up about 6 or 7%. In the period where the market is up 2%, you'd expect the stock to do roughly the risk-free rate because the market, but in the period where the market does nothing, let's say the market is flat, market's at 
What should your stock do if your stock has a beta 1.5? Should it be flat, should it go down, or should it go up? Work to the math. Risk-free rate is 2%, right? The market did nothing. So in that month, by investing in stocks, you actually earn 2% less than you could have. That RM minus RF that you see in the brackets is a minus 2%. What's your stock's beta? 1.5. 1.5 times minus 2%. So your stock should be down about 3% minus the risk-free rate, which is 2%. So basically, your stock should be down about 1% in a month in which the market does nothing. If your stock is a beta 1, your stock should also do what the market did. It should be at 0%. If your stock is a beta less than 1, then it should do a little better than the market, but not as well as the risk-free rate. See where I'm going? If your stock did exactly as predicted during the period of the regression, it should be earning, roughly speaking, the risk-free rate times 1 minus beta. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to compute what the risk-free rate times 1 minus beta is for your stock. That's what I'd expect the intercept to be. I'm going to look at the actual intercept, and then I'm going to compare those two numbers. The difference between those two numbers is called Jensen's alpha. And I'll come back and talk about why Jensen attached his name to it and why it's called an alpha. It's perhaps the most widely used measure of performance for portfolio managers in history. It's called Jensen's Alpha. And here's the way to read it. If that number is positive, your stock did better than expected, expected given, given, given its beta and given what the market did during the period. If that number is zero, your stock did exactly as expected. And if that number is negative, your stock did worse than expected. So I'll, I'll come back and put some numbers, and you can see whether Disney was a good investment or not once I plug in the numbers. But that's what the intercept tells me. It tells me whether my stock was a good or a bad investment during the period of the regression. And a little bit about the Jensen's Alpha. This measure is called Jensen's Alpha because it was created by Michael Jensen in the 1960s. Michael Jensen is one of the fathers of modern finance, and he was working at the University of Chicago. And he created to answer a very simple question to which Everybody thought they already knew the answer in the 1960s. And here was the question. Do professional money managers beat the market? 1963, we'd ask that question. People said, of course they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be professional. We took it for granted that if you put your money in a mutual fund or with a professional money manager, you would do better than if you managed your money yourself or bought stocks randomly. And Michael Jensen asked, try to answer questions. Is that true? And I, you know, I, I'm sure people are around and say, why are you wasting your time even asking this question? Of course we know it's true. He said, let's look at the numbers. He took a hundred and, I think, 15 mutual funds, which is how many there were in the market at that point in time, much smaller market. And he computed the Jensen's alpha for each of them. What I said the Jensen's alpha measures is how well you've done given your beta and given the risk you took and given what it's a market risk adjusted measure of performance. Now if the conventional hypothesis were true that professional money managers do better than the market, maybe not all 115, but most of the 115 should have had positive Jensen's alphas, right? And across the 115, the average Jensen's alpha should have been positive. And that's what I think he went in expecting to find. What he found instead is one of the most enduring findings in finance, a finding that's been replicated over and over again hundreds of times by different researchers. What do you think he found? What's the average, what, what, what was the average Jensen's alpha across the 115? Was it a positive or a negative number? It was negative. It was about negative 1.5%. Collectively, professional money managers, what did we do? We paid them to deliver 1.5% less than we could have made by not paying them. Let your mind get wrapped around the concept, and it'll show you why every year another 10% of the money managed by active money managers leaves them and goes to passive, to index funds and passive investing. It is the strangest business in the face of the earth, if you ask me. In fact, if I ran a plumbing business, and I ran it like this, I'd call it floods or us. Because here's what I do. You have a leak in your house, you call me, I'd come in and leave a flood. I wouldn't be in business too long. That's Jensen's Alpha. So Jensen's alpha is a measure of risk-adjusted, market-adjusted performance. It reflects the past, not the future. So when you sit down to do this regression, you have some choices to make. 
First, let's say you take a stock like Disney. You want to get a bait for Disney. It says run a regression of returns on your stock against returns on a market index. First question you have to answer is over what period? Disney's been a publicly traded stock for more than 50 years. I can go back and use more than 50 years in my regression. I have the data. Why might I not want to do that? If I go back to the 1950s and I can get the data, I, why shouldn't I just use it? What's my objective? To get a beta for the past or a beta for the future? To get a beta for the future. Somebody, I think, last session already talked about the backward-looking nature of what we do. This is a backward-looking beta. And if I go back too far, then I'm getting a company that doesn't resemble in the least the Disney of today. You know what Disney looked like in 1956? Disneyland hadn't even opened yet. Disney was a company that produced one animated movie every two or three years. It looked more like Lionsgate, riding up and down with Hunger Games than it did the Disney of today. So the first trade-off is how far back do I go? And the more my company is changing, the less I can go back in time. Second, given that time period, two years, and most services actually use between two and five years. I don't, I don't know of any service that tries to estimate betas beyond five years. Too much can change. Second, once you've decided the time period, two years, five years, you have to decide how you're going to slice up the data. Let me explain. You take five years of data, you can look at five years of three-month returns, which will give you about 20 observations and regressions. Five years of monthly returns, which will give you about 60 months. Five years of weekly returns, which will give you about 260 weeks. Five years of daily returns, which will give you 1,300 observations. Or five years of intraday returns. Now you can actually do hourly returns. You could get no, thousands and thousands of observations. Again, if you think purely in statistics terms, you're saying more data is best than le better than less data. So let me start slicing up the data finer and finer. Here again, there's a trade-off. As you start slicing up the data finer, you do get more observations, but the observations get noisier. What do I mean? If, if basically, we don't trade every minute of every day. When I start slicing up the data, strange things start to happen to my betas. In fact, there isn't a single service that even uses daily returns and betas because they're too noisy. Too much can go wrong. Most services use either weekly or monthly. Very few go to quarterly or annual data because you don't have enough observations. So how far back do you go? How are we going to slice up the data? Third point I have to raise is how do we come up with returns every period? There are two ways you make money on stocks. The first is Capital gains, which is the change in price, which will happen every period, right? If there's trading, if there's trading. And that will already tell you something about what's going to happen if you try to estimate betas for stocks in the liquid markets. In most periods, what is, what's your return going to look like? If you have no trading, it's going to look like a stock never moves. You're going to come to the conclusion, stocks are safe. They never seem to move. They're not moving. So the first is capital gains. What's the other? Dividends. But dividends don't get paid out every month or every week, right? They get paid out for many US stocks once every three months, for some once every six months, and many European stocks pay only once every year. Don't try to be fair and spread the dividends out across time. Take it in a month in which the stock goes X dividend. You get that dividend if you own it in that month or that week, and just let the market take care of the rest. So my return is going to be composed of the price change every period, which should be there almost every period, plus the dividend if there is one in that period. So I get the returns for the stock. I'm almost home. I have to pick an index. That should be easy, right? There are 125 equity indices just in the US. And I can, I can give you names. At one end, of course, any time people talk about the market, what are they usually talking about when you listen to the 6.30 news, the national news, and they talk about the market was up today. I wish it were the S&P 500. Unfortunately, it's still the Dow 30 that people still talk about, especially on CNBC, of course, they'll give you every index. But you're listening to CNN National News when they talk about the market, the Dow 30. Why? Because it's been around a really long time. The next most mentioned is the S&P 500. And then you have the NASDAQ, the NYC Composite, the Wilshire 5000. Go into Bloomberg, you can check 120. And you can pick any of them in running a regression. They're all market indices, and you're going to get very different betas. So how do I decide which index to use? Let me give you a clue. What, am I trying to, what model am I trying to estimate the beta for? The capital asset pricing model, right? Remember last session, what we all ended up with in our portfolios in the CAPM world? No transactions cost, no private information. We all ended up holding the market portfolio. What's in the market portfolio? 
Every single traded asset in the world held in proportion to its market value. Do you see where I'm going? The closer the index you pick is to that ideal, the better your beta is. That's going to give you a tiebreaker. So you see why would you never use the Dow 30 in a beta estimate? It's only 30 companies. You don't want to use the NYSE composite because it's a price-weighted index, not a value-weighted index. You're saying, what about the NASDAQ? The NASDAQ is not a market index. It's a tech index. You take Apple and Google out of it, what's left? Almost by default in the US, people end up using the S&P 500. It's only 500 companies, but it's saving graces, the 500 largest market cap companies. But I still have an issue with that, because when you go back to the CAPM, and I created the market portfolio, I said it included every single traded asset, not in the US, but anywhere. We're still very parochial about the way we estimate betas. We estimate the betas for US companies against the S&P 500, German companies against the DAX. And we live in a world where the biggest investor in the world is BlackRock, which invests globally. As investors become global, I think we've got to change our focus. But for the moment, when you look at beta services, they still stay parochial. And I think that's going to be a problem increasingly over time. So let me show you the choices I made for Disney. I decided to go back five years and use monthly data. Why five years and monthly? Because I like five years and monthly. I could have used two years and weekly. That's a Bloomberg default. I like five years and monthly. I think five years gives you enough time that you don't have one incident throwing off your beta. Like what? Yesterday, I was looking at the beta for Volkswagen on Bloomberg. And of course, the default for Bloomberg is two years of data. It's a lot of data, right? The only problem is for the last eight months, what's been happening at Volkswagen? What's been driving its stock price? Not how good it is as an auto company, not the auto business, but this scandal that keeps going and going and going. Every week, there's something coming out. You think, so what? Do you think that might affect your beta? Actually, let me ask you a follow-up question. Is it going to push up your beta, push down your beta? What is beta measure? How you move with the market, right? I create a perpetual scandal machine. You know what that's going to do? It's going to push your stock up or down. It's going to have nothing to do with the market, which means that your beta will actually start getting go lower and lower the more you introduce a scandal in the middle of your regression. It's very counterintuitive because you think of it as risky, but beta measures how you move with the market. And I've created something that makes you move in the other direction. So I want to kind of alleviate that effect, and that's why I go back five years. Every month, I computed the return at Disney. So as an example, in December of 2009, here's what I did. I took the price at the start of the month, the end of the month. So during that month, Disney stock price went up about $2. That was a month in which I got a dividend. So I added the 35 cents. My return for that month was 7.88%. And I repeated this for every month for the remaining 59. Change in price plus dividend only if there's a dividend. To do the index, I did exactly the same thing. I took the S&P 500 at the start, at the end of the period, and then I had to bring in the fact that if I bought the S&P 500, all 500 companies, I'd be getting a dividend every month, right? Because some of the stocks pay dividends, and that dividend is actually on Bloomberg. They give you the S&P 500 dividend, so I add that dividend on during the month, and I get a return for the S&P 500. So think of this as an Excel spreadsheet. I've got the prices for Disney, the returns on Disney, the pr levels of the index, the returns on the index. What do I want to do? I want to run a regression, so you're almost there, right? So you have Excel, you've got your spreadsheet ready to go, or a statistics package, many tab, whatever you decide to use. You've got the returns on the stock, the returns on the index. Before you run the regression, I'll make a suggestion, and this is a suggestion that was given to me at the start of my statistics class. He said, before you run a regression, look at the picture, look at the, take a visual, no, have a visual display of what the data looks like. You say, what the hell are you talking about? This is called a scatter plot. Remember those in statistics? Here's what you do in a scatter plot. I have 59 months of data. Why only 59? Because I need the change in price. I actually lost the first month. So as I go from January to 2008, so I have 59 months of data. If you really are one of those type A personalities, you can count the blue points. There should be 59 blue points here because each month, I plot that number in there. So this is Disney versus the S&P 500. There are 59 points. My regression line is actually my best fit line through these points. So how the hell am I going to come up with it? Well, here's what you don't do. You don't sit there with a ruler and say, that looks good, that looks better, or that looks even better. We'd go crazy. 
But statistics about 300 years ago started solving this problem. In fact, when you run a simple regression, what's it usually called? What's the, what's the criterion we use to decide what the best fit line is? We minimize the least squared distances. In fact, before statistics packages, before calculators, here's how people used to run regression. They'd sit there with a the ruler and measure the distance of each point from the line, take the squared distance, add them all up. Can you imagine how long it would have taken to run a regression? Thank God we live when we do, when we've taken a statistics back and say, run the regression. And that's what I did. I ran the regression. There's my best fit line. There's the output from the line. The intercept was 0.71%. Remember, because I'm doing everything in decimals, 0 .0, so the intercept was, don't do anything yet. I mean, it's good that the intercept is a positive number, but I'm going to come back and talk about what it tells me about Disney as a company. The slope of the line is 1.25. And if you want extra precision, 1.2517. What does that tell me? If I believe this regression, that's the beta for Disney, 1.25. Just to give you truth in advertising, though, there's a number I put below the 1.25 in brackets. If you remember your statistics class, you report one of two things in brackets. You either report the T statistic, which I haven't, or the standard error. This is the standard error in my estimate. For the moment, just let it be. Because you, if you've forgotten the regression, you say, who cares what the standard is? I'm going to come back and make you use it when you think about using this regression to estimate the beta for Disney. You ready? We're going to use this regression to take apart Disney. The way I think about regressions is think like a doctor, and I'm a new patient. I come in, and before you do anything, you say, I'd like to run a series of tests, and you run a series of blood tests, whatever. You take a look at the blood test. It gives you some sense of what my problems are, what I might have to worry about. Think of this as the equivalent. You're starting to know your company. A regression lets you get acquainted with your company on many dimensions. So let's start with the intercept, because it's going to tell me whether Disney was a good investment between 2008 and 2013. Notice I keep emphasizing the word was, because this is a postmortem. So between 2008 and 2013, when I ran the regression, the intercept I got was 0.712%. So that came out of the regression. Now, what do I need to compare that to? I need to compare that to what Disney should have done in a month in which the market did nothing. Remember that simple example I started with? The beta was greater than one. So in this case, Disney's beta is greater than one, it's 1.25, not one. So I would expect it to actually go down in a month in which the market does nothing. But how much? I took the, the risk-free rate during the period, 0.5%. That was an annualized risk-free rate. I divided by 12 to come up with a monthly risk rate. Saying, why are you doing that? Because my returns are all monthly returns. If I'd done this in weekly terms, I'd have divided by 52. Daily, I'd have divided by 365. So I get a monthly risk free rate, which is tiny, 0.04%. I multiply the risk free rate times 1 minus beta. I come up with minus 0.01%. You're saying, what does that even mean? If Disney had done exactly as predicted during this period, Given its beta and given what the market did, I'd have expected the intercept to be minus 0.01%. It actually was plus 0.71%. The difference between those two numbers is 0.72%. And the way I'd read this is between 2008 and 2013, on a monthly basis, Disney did 0.72% better than expected. A part of you is saying, 0.72, who cares? That's nothing. That's per month. If you make 0.72% better than expected every month, on an annualized basis, that's like 9% a year. Again, let me give you an intuitive way of thinking about this 9%. Let's make it a very simple example. Let's assume you have a stock with a beta 1.25, just like Disney. Let's say the market is up 20%. Let's assume the risk-free rate is close to zero, like it is now. Market's up 20%, stock with a beta 1.25, how much would you expect the stock to be up this year, this month? The market's up 20%, your beta is 1.25, you should be up 25%. When I say the Jensen's Alpha is 9%, here's what I'm saying about Disney. It went up 25% plus 9%. It's a risk-adjusted, market-adjusted measure of performance. So it effectively captures not just what the market did, but what your stock should have done given its risk. That's a Jensen's alpha for Disney. What does it tell me? It tells me something about Disney in the past. So I'm going to take this number and see what we can do with it. So here's the first thing I'm going to ask you. 
Let's assume I did what I did for Disney for every stock in the market, starting with A, working all the way through Z. Get the Jensen's Alpha for every one of them. And then I average the Jensen's Alpha across every stock in the market. Do you see what I'm doing? I get the Jensen's Alpha for each stock, and then I average them across stocks. What should the average Jensen's Alpha across all stocks be? Zero. It should be zero. You see why? Because when I tell you the collective Jensen's Alpha for all stocks is 7%, here's why it's absurd. I'm telling you collectively stocks did 7% then stocks. Can't happen. But it also, I'm trying to put a damper on your greed. Because when you compute the Jensen's Alpha for your stock and you get 2%, you're going to say, that is awful. I got only 2%. You know why you should be celebrating? What's the sign in front of the 2%? It's a positive number. What did I say the, the average portfolio manager earns an Jensen's Alpha of? Minus what? With 0%. You should be dancing in the street. Look, I made 0% Jensen's Alpha. You just beat the average portfolio manager, which is what you're doing with an index fund. So a Jensen's Alpha that's positive is good news. Now, are there stocks with great Jensen's Alpha? Sure. Now, if you bought Netflix or Amazon two years ago, you know what a Jensen's Alpha would look like right now over the last two years? Probably plus 70%. What does that tell you? I wish I'd bought Netflix two years ago. That's all it tells me. And before you waste too much time regretting the fact that you did not buy Netflix and make that plus 70%. Here's what you should be also thankful for. That you did not buy GoPro two years ago at 93. It's at 13 right now. And it's Jensen's Alpha. It's probably minus it's for every Netflix there is a GoPro. So while you want to regret not buying the Netflix, let it go because who knows, you could have bought GoPro instead. Things happen. Jensen's Alpha is a backward-looking, and that's effectively what you're getting, is a backward-looking analysis of whether your stock was a good or a bad investment. Let's go further. This is a corporate finance class. You say, why do I care about Jensen's Alpha? I'm not a portfolio manager. Because we want to judge management on whether they're doing a good job, right? So let me play a role. In this case, I'll be CEO of Disney, Bob Iger. And let's say it's November of 2013, and get up in front of you. Your stockholders in Disney, and I say, look, over the last five years, I've delivered a Jensen's Alpha of plus 9%. That's good, right? Positive. I'd like a bonus. See the question I'm asking? When you see a positive Jensen's Alpha for a company, is it an indicator that your company was well managed? Can I make that leap? That companies with positive Jensen's Alphas are well managed and companies with negative Jensen's Alphas are badly managed? Yes. Well, the expectation's already built in, right? So basically, the beta captures the expectation. The market is up. You beat your expectations by 9%. You should look at your competitors. Tell me why. So you're saying, I should look at entertainment companies. They collectively deliver. Let's actually take a very much simpler sector, and you can see this work out. Yeah. It could be that entire so social media stocks are all eight, up 80%. The fact that they're up only 60%, maybe I should punish you, not reward you, right? I'll give you a very simple way of understanding why negative Jensen's alphas are not always an indicator of management. If I took every oil company on the face of the earth, every single one of them, for the last two years, what Jensen's alpha am I going to see for every single oil company? Across the board, what are you going to see? Every single oil company has a negative Jensen's Alpha over the last two years. It must be horribly managed, right? But how do you explain the negative Jensen's Alpha Alphas across all oil companies? Oil prices went from $70 a barrel to $27 a barrel. This has nothing to do with management. So you can have a negative Jensen's Alpha and be a well-managed company. You can have a positive Jensen's Alpha and be a badly managed company to make that final judgment. So if you gave me Exxon Mobil with a negative Jensen's Alpha of 15%, before I leap to conclusions, here's what I'm going to look at. The average Jensen's Alpha across all oil companies is minus 45%. At minus 15%, Exxon Mobil is smelling like a rose because it's relative. Same thing here. 
I'd have to look at the entertainment sector. I'd look at the collective Jensen's alphas. And if you go to my website, I actually have average Jensen's alphas by sector precisely for this reason. Because I want to be able to make that comparison before I make that leap of judgment about the management. One final question. This, I think, cuts to the core of how we think about investing. So you see this positive Jensen's alpha for Disney from 2008 to 2013. You don't own Disney stock yet, but you look at this number and say, this is really good. Then we go buy Disney stock now, now being November of 2013. See the question I'm asking? When you make investments as an investor, should you be directing your investments to the stocks with the biggest Jensen's alphas? Let me rephrase that question. What has to be true about stocks for that strategy to work? Stocks that have done well in the past should continue. If momentum were the driver of returns, then you should be going after positive Jensen's alphas. So momentum investor is really an investor who looks for stocks with big positive Jensen's alphas and piles in. What does a contrarian investor do? He actually does the exact opposite. He says, those stocks that have gone up the most are not where I want to put my money. I want to go with the stocks which, it's actually a very perverse strategy. You're going look, looking for the 50 stocks that are the worst Jensen's alphas. Your money is in GoPro and LinkedIn, not in Netflix and Amazon. You say, why would I do that? Because you're assuming that things reverse. I fall in the middle. I think that your odds are a little better with the negative alpha stocks. That's my... That's my gut because behavioral finance tells me that's true. I'm not ready to make that automatic jump of saying, if GoPro is down 80%, it must be cheap. You know why that's not true? Because it, go to, it could go to zero. Nick Woodman keeps running the company the way he is. He's going to drive it to zero. And when are we going to get see the Hero 5 or the Hero 6 or the Hero 7? I mean, they've been telling us for a year. This is a company that's a single product company. The only way you can decide, I think, is you have to make your own assessment. You have to value the company. If you're interested, I put up my GoPro valuation yesterday. I won't tell you what my conclusion was. You can go read it. Because I took GoPro and LinkedIn. Both looked contrarian, like contrarian bets. I, I bought one. I've not bought the other. And you might be surprised which one I bought and which one I did not. But that's again Jensen's Alpha, not driving my, but it tells me where to go looking. I use negative Jensen's Alphas to decide where to go look, but it's not going to tell me where to invest because I still have to do my homework. Any questions on Jensen's Alphas? Yeah? When your homework work at it from the other end, how can we start to unpack what you mean then over that period of time? Okay, so you can start breaking it out into pieces, right? Some of this might be sector driven. In a case like Disney, you can actually start looking at how much of this is ESPN. So if I look 2013 through 2015, the Jensen's Alphas turned negative, primarily because of ESPN worries. Right? So you can take ESPN apart and say, is that going to continue? So you can actually take the fundamentals of the company said this is it's very difficult to get precise answers but you can at least say these are the four things that drove my Jensen's alpha and then you have to ask a follow-up question are they going to keep no are they going to keep pushing my returns up or down and that's what's going to determine what you as an investor will do for some companies like oil companies 90% of what happens comes from one factor oil prices and if you feel you can't predict oil prices not much you can do but if you feel you can predict oil prices that's what you base it on so when, when you start unpacking, you're always going to have to start to dig to see what it is that happened to that company during that period and say, how did that feed into my returns? So that's an open investigation. Right? It's an open, that's, what, that's exactly what a valuation is supposed to be, right? So when I had to value GoPro, that's exactly what I had to do. Why were the returns down? What is happening to revenues? Why are revenues dropping? And that's when you start noticing that the Hero 4 is aging, people are not buying it. Either they're waiting for the Hero 5 or worse, they're buying one of the competitor's products, and they're starting to show up. So when you start that investigation, in a sense, you might start narrow, but it's going to start to widen. But the whole point of valuation is to make that investigation and make a judgment on what do you think about the price today. Okay. Any other questions? So that's a Jensen's alpha. Yeah? How do you regularize your sector? Yeah. There, there are other things. It could be that 
depending on where you are in the oil production cycle that refining companies might be. So you might have to slice and dice. So ExxonMobil might look good relative to all oil companies, but then you might have to do a slice against integrated oil companies. So you have the luxury of data. And that's the advantage of having all this data and capital IQ at your fingertips, is you can start slicing and dicing the companies to see how much of this is due to great management. I'll be quite honest. Nothing in ExxonMobil has anything to do with management. That's a strong statement. But this is a company that essentially is so big and so integrated that you could have a robot running the company and probably get pretty much the same results. In fact, here's a good indicator. Who's the CEO of ExxonMobil? I have no idea, and I don't care. Whereas with a, with a young startup, you better care who the CEO is because you care whether it's... Uh, a person that you think is competent, that can change. So with young companies, it makes a big difference. With ExxonMobil, it's almost autopilot. Right? So that's my priors, but I have to check to see the data if, in fact, that's backed up. Now let's talk about beta. As I said, most bankers, we ask them where the betas come from, will tell you it comes from a service. So I'll be your service, you be my banker, and let's see whether we can use this regression. Actually, you be the service, I'll be the banker, because that's so much easier for me. And I'm going to ask you some questions about Disney. So it's late at night. I'm a banker. I need a beta for Disney. I call you. You're my service. We pay you a half a million dollars to supply betas for us. So I'm doing the old-fashioned way. I could email you, but I decided to call you. Why to show you I'm still at my desk at 9 o'clock? And you're still at your desk at 9 o'clock, which tells me something about your job versus my job, because I get paid probably five times more than you. What the hell are you doing on your desk? But let's say you're still at your desk. Maybe you're on the West Coast. You work at Barra, and I'm on the East Coast. So I need a beta for Disney. As for one number, a point estimate. You have the regression in front of you. What's the one number you'd give me as my beta for Disney? Don't think too long. It's a 1.25, right? You run the regression. That's, so if you wanted a point estimate, that's where you'd stop. And then you try to hang up the phone really fast. Because here's my follow-up question. I remember some statistics. And I say, wait, wait, wait. Before you hang up the phone, with 67% confidence, can you give me a range for this beta? What's the significance of the 67%? In statistics, in a normal distribution, it's one standard deviation. When you run regressions, the coefficients are normally distributed. Even if the, if the data is not, the coefficient, so the slope of the line has a, has a normal distribution. And the standard error tells you how much noise there is in your estimate. And I told you the standard error is 0 0.10. With 67% confidence, what's the range on Disney's beta? 1.15 to 1.35. Do you see why? Start with the 1.25, subtract out one standard error, add one standard error. You got the range with 67% confidence. Then you get ready to hang up the phone again. I said, no, no, wait. With 90, remember, 67% confidence is not that good. I'm going to be wrong a third of the time. So I said, with 95% confidence, gives me a range. That's, it's 1.96, so let's round it up. Two standard errors in either direction, which means my true beta can be 1.96. 05 to 1.45. What I'm trying to get you used to is we think of betas as facts. Even if they come from services, they're estimates with ranges. You think maybe this is just Disney. I'm sure other betas are more precise. I have some really bad news. If you look at the standard errors of beta estimates, this is how much noise there is in a beta. The median standard error on a beta estimate for a US company is about 0.20. Think about that. Next time you hear somebody say the beta for Coca-Cola is 1.1, what they're not telling you is the true beta could be anywhere from 0.7 to 1.5, plus or minus two standard errors. There's nothing wrong with it if you're honest about it, but why do we act like these are facts? And this also explains why if you have a company and you look up the beta in five different services, Yahoo Finance, Bloomberg, Google Finance, you'll actually get different betas for the same company. Don't freak out. They're all pulling from distributions, and they're all wrong. Why? Because you're making it, no, it's coming from a distribution. So betas are, come in ranges, and the standard error captures that range. Which brings me to my third and final piece of output from the regression, which is the R squared. In fact, before I go further than the R squared, if this is a statistics class, you're taught to push towards 100% R squared. That's a great regression, right? Don't even try. In finance, the R squared actually has an economic meaning. 
The R squared for Disney is 73%. What does that mean? 73% of the risk in Disney comes from the market. 27% comes from the firm. You're saying, who cares? Remember that second step in risk and return models in finance? We divided risk into firm-specific risk and market risk, and we said one disappears as you, put, as you get more diversified. So which of these two components is going to disappear? Well, the 27% is going to go away as you get more diversified. There's an interesting sub-story here that I have to mention. That 73% R squared that you see for Disney would have been an astonishingly high number in 2007. 2007, Disney's R squared was closer to 35%. Over the last seven years, you've seen R squareds climb for US stocks. In fact, globally, you've seen this climb in R squared. What does that tell us? More of the risk in every company is coming from the market, less is coming from the firm. It's kind of a scary thought if you're an old time value investor. Old time value investors were taught that. When you want to invest, go pick a stock, do your research. Don't worry about macro stuff. It'll all get averaged out. That's no longer true, because you could do everything right as an investor and one macro shock away from having 50% of your portfolio disappear. We no longer have the luxury of just focusing on the micro, on the company. We have to constantly think about the macro forces, because they're going to affect your valuation. One final point about R squared. So let's suppose Disney's R squared is 73%. And let's suppose I told you that the R squared for Amgen is, tw is, is 25%, much lower, one third the R squared of Disney. But that they both have the same bait, and everything else about them looks the same. Same growth rate, same cash flows. Only difference between the two companies is one has a high R squared, the other is a low R squared. So I want you to think like a diversified investor now. You run Fidelity Magellan. And you're trying to decide between these two stocks. Which one would you rather have in your portfolio as a diversified investor, the high R squared stock or the low R squared stock? Or you, you said high and you said low. So let me take each of you and ask you. So when you said high, what was your rationale? OK, so basically, you will pick the high R squared because you can get rid of the remaining 27%. After you're done getting rid of the 27%, you're going to be left with just the market risk, which I'm capturing with a beta of 1.25. So let's take the low R squared. Same reason. You, you, you diversify, you get rid of the 73%. And after you're done diversifying, you're going to be left with the market risk, which I capture with a beta of 1.25. Do you see where I'm going? If you're a diversified investor, you're going to get rid of the firm specific risk either way. You're not even going to look at R squares, because why do you care? Because at the end of the process, the beta will capture the number of units of market risk you face in both. And the fact that one, much of the risk got diversified, and the other, less doesn't matter to you. You're, you're diversified. So as a diversified investor, you don't care about R squared. Let's take a second scenario. If you were in Bill's class, does he talk about his crazy uncle still? Yeah. 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 Crazy aunt, right? <laughs> Uh, let's make a crazy uncle. Why be sexist about this? We've got crazies on both sides. So let's say it's Thanksgiving, and you have the singular misfortune of being seated next to the craziest uncle in the family. This conspiracy is coming out of him like crazy. He says, look, I don't trust these mutual fund guys. They all steal from you, which is partially true. But he then jumps to the next step, which is he said, I buy only three stocks. That's what I've always done, and it's worked for me. You know, it's pointless arguing with him about diversification, showing him variance, covariance, matrices. He doesn't care. Three stocks. So you know you're stuck on the three stocks. And you're saying, and he says, which three stocks should I buy? First piece of advice. A crazy uncle asks you for advice on which stocks to buy. Don't respond. But you have no choice. It's Thanksgiving. You have two hours to go. You have to give three stocks. Now let me ask you the same question I asked you as a diversified investor. Would you rather that your uncle own Disney, or would you rather that he own Amgen? He's going to be an undiversified investor, right? He's got only three stocks. Is he going to be damaged more by holding a low R squared stock or a high R squared stock? 
he's going to be damaged more by holding a low R squared stock. You know, you see why, right? Because if he buys a 25% R squared stock, he's not going to diversify the remaining 75%. He's going to be exposed to the remaining 75% and not get rewarded for it for the same reason you don't get rewarded for living across a six-lane highway and running across the six lanes to get to your brokerage house. It's avoidable risk. So if you were advising him, you'd probably advise him to buy Disney. And if you can slip it in, ask him to buy SPX which is actually, the, you can buy spiders, which is the S he doesn't even know it's not a stock, he's buying the S&P 500, he's going to tell you, this is an amazing stock, it does exactly what the market does. Okay? Just let it go, act like a genius. Okay? You want higher R squares if you're not diversified. So that's the regression that's taking apart the regression. If this were 2002, at this stage in the class, here's what I'd have asked you to do. I'd have asked you to do what I did for Disney. Go collect 60 months of prices, put them in an Excel spreadsheet, run the, it's not rocket science, you could do it. And if some of you still want to do it, you're welcome to. But there's a shortcut you can use, which is to find a Bloomberg terminal, find your stock, which is actually a little bit of work for some of your stocks. Find your stock and then type in the word beta. This is a Bloomberg beta page. And when Bloomberg, I think, delivered its first terminal about 10 years ago, it was a godsend because it meant for this part of the class, I could tell people, go get, print off a beta page. You can skip that Excel spreadsheet. And when we first got the Bloomberg, the first thing I had to check was whether the numbers coming from Bloomberg matched up to the numbers I was coming up with my Excel spreadsheet with the same company over the same period of time. So here's what I did. I printed off. Disney's beta using five years of monthly returns, just like I ran my Excel regression against the S&P 500 from 2008 to 2013. Exact same time period, exact same monthly returns, same index. I should get exactly the same output, right? So I'd like you to turn back a few pages to my regression because I'm going to show you the numbers I got from Disney. And let's see if they match up to what I got in the regression. Ready? My regression was, I think, 150 something. Let's go back one page. What page is that? Oh, no, no, it's too much. Too much. Page 125. Look at the bottom of page 125. Right? See my regression? So let's go through the output. Let's start at the top. Raw beta. That is Disney, I'm sorry, that's Bloomberg's version of a regression beta. Their regression beta is 1.247. Mine was 1.252. We round up 1.25. So that we matched up, which is good, because that's the whole part of the regression, right? Getting a beta. So I got the same beta. Skip the adjusted beta, I'll come back to it. Then they have something they call the alpha, but that's really their version of the intercept. It's really not an alpha, so don't get mixed up with the Jensen's alpha. That's their intercept. Their intercept was 0.59%. Mine was 0.71%, I think. And when I first started running these regressions, it used to drive me crazy that I couldn't get the same intercept. And here's the reason. When I ran my regression, remember how I brought in dividends into my stock when I computed returns? And then I brought in dividends into my returns when I did the market as well? Bloomberg skips including dividends when they do returns. Why? Because it's so much simpler just to run the regression. I mean, remember, these regressions are run by computers, so it's so much easier not having to throw the dividend in. They run their regressions with just price changes. Their defense would be? What's the big deal? We get roughly the same beta as I did for Disney, so why are you making such a big deal? For Disney, it's probably not a big deal. But you see so, for some stocks why a Bloomberg beta is not going to be a good indicator, even if you trusted regression betas. Let's say you got the bulk of your returns on a stock from dividends. When would that be true? You're buying utilities, master limited partnerships. Don't trust the beta you get from Bloomberg for those companies, because they're ignoring dividends. But for the most part, the numbers we get match up. So the intercept is pretty close. It's off by 0.12%, but not a big deal. My Jensen self is still going to be positive. My R squared is 73.4%. Again, very close to my number. So numbers match up. The standard error is 0 0.099, very close to my 0 0.10. So the two regressions look very similar. I'm almost ready to close this page when my eye gets drawn to the adjusted beta. Adjusted. Must be adjusted for something, right? Bloomberg estimates adjusted betas for, I think, 41,000 companies. All, every publicly traded company in the face of the earth, this page will show up. The adjusted beta for every single one of the 41,000 companies is computed exactly the same way. It's two-thirds times the raw beta, plus 
plus one third times one. We repeat that again. Two thirds times the raw beta plus one third times one. You say, what the hell are you doing? Let's check some numbers out. Let's say your raw beta is 1.8. Two thirds times the raw beta would be 1.2 plus one third times one is 0.33. So I'm going to get 1.53. So 1.8 will give me 1.53. 1.5 will become 1.33. So see, see if you see a pattern here. 1.2 will become 1.13. 0 0.6 will become 0 0.73. So what are they doing? They're taking the regression betas and moving them towards one. What's so magical about one? It's the average beta for the market. They're trying to help you. They're saying, you know what? Your company will probably get more diversified over time. It'll probably get into other businesses. Therefore, your beta will move towards one. To which your response is, please stop helping. Because <laughs> these weights must be magic weights to work for every company in the face of the earth, right? I could ask you where the weights come from, but that wouldn't be fair. I didn't know the answer. I called Bloomberg. Not the mayor, but the company. Maybe I should have called the mayor. He'd have given you a better answer. And I said, I'd like to talk to somebody about your beta page. They put me in touch with a guy whose life it is to maintain this page. Imagine how exciting his life must be. He goes to a cocktail party and says, I'm the beta guy at Bloomberg. <laughs> Dozens of people gather around for anecdotes. Not. <laughs> Pathetically grateful to get a call from the outside world. He says, I have all day to answer your questions. I don't know, maybe they keep him locked up in a basement room, feed him through a hole in the wall, whatever it is, you know. I have all day to ask him questions. So I, after a few minutes of polite conversation, because I didn't want to hang up the phone too soon, he might have done something rash. I hit him with a question, why two thirds and one third? Two minutes of silence, I can hear papers being rustled, terminals being turned off and on. Finally he comes back on, he says, I don't know, it was here when I got here. <laughs> so what do you mean? So I was hired two years ago, I was already here, don't blame me. Not blaming, I just want to know where the numbers come from. He said, I don't know. Here when I got here. I just finished my 11th book last week. I've got the title for my 12th book picked out. I have nothing written, but the title is the most critical part. It's going to be called Here When I Got Here. Because <laughs> you know how often that is the answer to questions you ask about numbers you use every day on your job? Why do we use that number? I don't know. It's here when I got here. When did you get here? 1979? So I'm going to close off here. If you're going to use this, I'm going to ask you to print this Bloomberg beta page, but don't use the adjusted beta. All it's telling you is which direction one is and nothing else. Yes, yes Lana. I have a question. So our group, and I'll just talk to you about the Thank you.